I'd like to introduce our wonderful panelists to you. I'm going to start at this end with Mina. Mina Salami is a Nigerian, Finnish, and Swedish feminist author and social critic. She is the program chair of Black Feminism and the Poly Crisis at the New Institute. Her research focuses on Black feminist theory, contemporary African thought, and the politics of knowledge production. Mia frequently speaks at international platforms, including TEDx, Oxford University, Yale, Oxford Union, Cambridge, Europe, European Parliament, and the Singularity University at NASA. She is a BMW Foundation Herbert Quant responsible leader and sits on the Council of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. Mina is also an associate with Perspectiva and sits on the <laughs> and sits on the boards of the African Feminist Institute at Pennsylvania State University and the Interdisciplinary Journal for the Study of the Sahel. Next we have Nura Farab. Nura Farab grew up on the front lines of climate change in the Maldives one of the most climate vulnerable countries in the world due to the country's natural land scarcity and low-lying geography. She has lived experience of how climate change shapes socioeconomics, psychology, and the security of communities. After a business and law school in the UK, Nara has worked in charities, cooperatives, and ethical finance in the UK. Nora is currently Deputy Chief Executive Officer at Climate Outreach, an organization working to create a social mandate for climate action. And next we have Will Goldring. Will is a former scientist who dropped out of a neuropharmacology PhD at University College London to devote his entire life to mobilizing people to come together in civil resistance against government inaction on climate breakdown. Will has been arrested seven times and charged with criminal damage at universities which refused to die blessed from fossil capital, with breaking into fuel terminals and shutting them down, blocking roads in London, and with causing 230,000 pounds of criminal damage to petrol pumps on the N25. For the last charge, Wallace Space had crown court trial in 2024, was unlikely to find a sentence of up to 10 years in prison if found guilty by a jury. And finally, we have uh, Professor Rupert Reed. Uh, Rupert is an associate professor of philosophy at the University of East Anglia, an author, a journalist, and a climate and environmental campaigner. One of his key points of focus is the Climate Majority Project, of which he is a co-director. Previously, Wilfred was a frequent spokesperson for Extinction Rebellion and a spokesperson, national parliamentary candidate, European parliamentary candidate, and councillor for the Green Party of Wales in England, um, England and Wales. Sorry, I don't know why my brain just said that. Um, and it just says England and Wales rather than Wales. Sorry. <laughs> what? He also formerly chaired the ecological think tank Greenhouse. Rupert has extensive experience arguing for ecological causes in the media, having written for The Guardian, The Independent, and The Ecologist, and many, many other newspapers and websites. Please um, join me in welcoming Mina, Noura, Will, and Rupert. Thank you so much to you all for being here. I'm very excited that what you hold and bring is all present today as ingredients in this conference. So we're gonna dive right in with this one primary question. It sort of has two parts and for the next 45 minutes, let's see what comes out of it. Okay, so. How do you bridge divides in your work? And what was the inner shift, the inner divide that you crossed that led you to the work you do now? So dig deep for the later part, letter half of this question. And I mean, for the former too, but I, I really, you know, 
want all the threads that form these two components to come out. So uh, whoever wants to go first can go first. At certain points, I might say, what do you think? Or, you know, but. <laughs> you want to, yeah? <laughs> go for it. Yeah, thanks so much. Thanks, everybody. So I'll start with the, the, the second one, try and, try and dig deep. Um, so in, uh, I, I've been in this game for a long time. I mean, the game of trying to save the world and um, with everybody else. And uh, in 2015, uh, there was a big shift uh, for me in, in that game, which was uh, I was delivering leaflets for the Green Party and uh, noticing the state of all the gardens where I was delivering the leaflets some so immaculate that it was obvious to people be using weed killer. Um, others paved over with cars in them, one with an abandoned car, uh, one with a, a, a dead fridge uh, in the front of it. Uh, and um, these words flashed into my head, unbidden. Uh, and the words were, this civilization is finished. Uh, and I sort of reeled and stopped and had a sort of existential crisis, I suppose, for the next few weeks, um, not really knowing what to do. And I started to write my way out of the crisis, as, as writers do. So I wrote this piece called, funnily enough, This Civilization is Finished. And I shared it with some people very carefully uh, because I was nervous that they would hate it or that they would accuse me of depressing them or of demoralizing the reader. But they didn't. They more or less all said, this is more important than anything you've written before. And so I started to bring it into the world. And firstly, I published it anonymously because I was still afraid of the response. Uh, and then I started giving talks um, uh, about it. And this went on for a while and it gradually kind of uh, grew in um, volume and resonance. In 2017, uh, I gave the talk to my students and to first year students at my university. Uh, and students came up to me afterwards and said things like, this feels like the first time that anyone in a position of sort of authority has really leveled with us and thank you for doing it. And uh, then in summer of 2018, um, I heard about this fledgling organization. You may have heard of it. It's called Extinction Rebellion. Uh, and I um, was an early adopter of their Heading for Extinction and What to Do About It video. And I, I helped to launch Extinction Rebellion, as you've heard, became a, a strategist and spokesperson. And we achieved something remarkable in uh, 2019. We, we, it was great to be part of something that actually worked. You know, that, that's, that's part of what was significant uh, about it. And uh, yeah, we, we broke through into uh, the climate consciousness of the nation and to some extent the world. And um, that was kind of mostly what we achieved. We, we didn't actually get our demands satisfied. I mean, they were sort of satisfied in, in the breach rather than the observance. The UK Parliament declared a climate and environment emergency, but it was non-binding. And there was a non-binding citizens' assembly, and there was a, a binding uh, law for zero carbon, but by 2050 rather than 2025. Um, all good stuff, but there was a limit to it. So now that comes to really what I think you're asking about for me, which is when did I start to realize that there had to be more work done to bridge divides. Because by 2020, it had become clear to me that Extinction Rebellion had reached most of the limit of what it was capable of doing, at least for the moment. And that it had had a lot of success, but by way of, in part, polarizing. Uh, we deliberately forced a national conversation, and it worked, but the consequence was some further polarization and that has continued uh, since. So that's why I started writing in 2021 
uh, to the effect that we needed a, uh, a moderate flank, a new moderate flank, to fill the space that had been opened up by the success of the radical flank in 2019. Uh, and that this moderate flank would have to go about seeking to bring people together and to depolarize. Uh, and I published a, a big essay about this in Perspectiva uh, and agitated for it for a while. Then I started to get some funding for it. And uh, we launched a website last year. And two weeks ago, we launched the Climate Majority Project, which is now the em embodiment of this endeavor. Uh, and it's going quite well and excitingly. Uh, you may have, may have heard of it. It's not as famous as Extinction Rebellion yet, but it's early days. And central to our mission is depolarization um, because it's clear to us that unless you get the majority of people, the moderate majority, the silent majority, behind climate action, it is never going to happen. Uh, and that's for two reasons. Firstly, there's never going to be the pressure that politicians, etc., feel to actually do it. But secondly, also, it can't actually exist unless you do that. Because the climate and other aspects of the poly crisis as well, unlike, for example, the ozone crisis, which was essentially amenable to technocratic innovation and solution, the climate crisis affects virtually all aspects of our lives. It's tied up with everything. Unless people are willing to do in their lives the things that it will take to actually get somewhere on it, then we're not going to get anywhere on it. So there is no non more or less democratic way of resolving uh, the crisis. So that was the, the crucial development for me when a couple of years ago it became clear to me, two or three years ago, it became clear to me gradually that unless we did this hard work of depolarizing, uh, then we were never actually going to get where we needed to be and that that necessitated a different approach from the approach, the approach of the radical flank, which had opened the space but wasn't capable of fully exploiting the space and wasn't capable of doing this work of bridging divides without which, well, as I say, this civilization is finished. You've described the landscape beautifully, but before we pass this on to another panelist, would you just briefly give an example of how the project deals with somebody who's coming from a very different polar or perhaps polarized viewpoint, how, how would you or how would the project address that? Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, thanks. So we are seeking to appeal beyond the progressive activist demographic. We are seeking to get outside the kind of climate bubble, if you will, unless we do that when we don't have a majority. So in our audience research, for example, we've, we've looked at how to reach people who are uh, right of center, how to reach people who are um, apolitical. Um, and it turns out that these people are um, reachable. Uh, if, you, if you signal to them that you want to be more welcoming than pretty much anyone in the space has been previously to people who don't look like what they imagine activists look like. And in particular, and this is again uh, another thing we published in Perspectiva, you have to make it clear to people that you don't need to be an activist to take action on climate and ecology. That you can do it with others in your local community. Uh, that you can do it with others in your workplace, in your profession, in your business. So for example, one of the poster children of the Climate Majority Project is an organization called Lawyers for Net Zero, mm -hmm. where we work with senior uh, corporate lawyers, not exactly your standard climate activists. I mean, they're not climate activists at all, but they are people with some power, and a lot of them now want to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. So that's partly what it's about. And one of the ways we've tried to signal this in our launch period, as some of you may have seen, is that we've assembled a coalition of unusual suspects, so including people from business, including people from the conservatives, to say, actually, you know what? We have to pull together and do this uh, together. We have to get serious on it together. Uh, if we don't, there is no uh, seriousness on it. Thank you so much. It sounds like you're doing three things. You're deconstructing the identity of who can respond to the crisis and who shouldn't. Then you are changing or adapting the narrative so that it's pertinent to the person you're talking to. Yeah. And then finding ways to practically cooperate. 
Yeah, that's fair, thanks. So who would like to go next? If you want, I can repeat the question. I'll just repeat the question once more, it's been... So, how do you bridge divides in your work? And what was the inner shift, the inner divide that you crossed that led you to the work you do now? Trying. <laughs> Great. Um, at Climate Outreach, um, what we do is uh, research into human behavior and social science um, to enable and catalyze organizations like yours um, to be able to uh, connect and engage with parts of the population that normally doesn't really engage with the climate movement. Um, so it's great to hear that some of the work's being utilized. Um, we've partnered with More in Common. More in Common is an organization that was founded after Joe Cox's death uh, to highlight that we have more in common as humanity than we are divided. And we've used their um, research and built on it in collaboration with More in Common to segment the British population, their concern levels, and what values and motivators drives them to be concerned about climate. And uh, actually what our research showed is that um, there is general consensus across the population that British, it's fair to say British population is really concerned about climate regardless of their political ideology or where they live or class. But as we all know, we all have our own cultural assumptions, our own set of values that's shaped through time. Um, and uh, so, I might be concerned about climate because of where I grew up and my life and lived experience, but one of you might not be and it might be something very completely different that drives your concern. It might be um, preserving the wildlife and biodiversity in your habitat, or it might be your occupation, or it could be a number of things. So we have a, what we call the Britain Talks Climate. Um, is a project uh, which is planned over a number of years um, and we hope to build on it and what it does is help organizations that's uh, in the activism space and also in community grassroots and also sort of like um, any social, social agents that wants to catalyze a movement. It gives you the information around how you can build narratives and values-based frames and a dialogue that could enable you to have that meaningful conversation with the parts of the population. Um, as you've highlighted that um, environmentalist movement in the traditional senses we know tend to be appealing only with one segment of the British population and that's about 17%. I don't want to underestimate the power of activism activism, it does keep the concerns level on our radar and the challenge for the movement and the challenge for us is to turn that concern into action. And uh, so we do a lot of work to identify and understand where people are at, what is their value system. And today I heard a lot about the themes of compassion and empathy coming through today, throughout the day. And that's exactly what we do. We try to empathize where people are what has shaped their beliefs and value systems and their thoughts, whether it is opposing views or whether it is supportive views, and build on it, connect on it. So that's one thing we do to bridge the divides. So it's very much based on, we're not gonna focus on giving a lot of information to you to change your minds, but that rather we're gonna have a two-way conversation, human to human, and celebrate our humanity. Would you be able to share a story about that? Um, a story in the sense like a case study or? When you saw this happen. When I saw this happening, <laughs> great. Um, <laughs> so we, we, we have, we ha one of the case studies is for example, with Fair Energy Transition, which is a consortium of Pan Europe, which we collaborated with a number of organizations, including Galbankian and MacArthur Foundation. Um, so just highlighting and giving you credit, it's not just climate outreach, it's a big effort. Um, in that piece of work, we were trying to understand what different segments um, actually understood 
when we say fair energy transition, politicians speak about it, economists speak about it, movements speak about it, but what does it really mean? Does it, what does it mean? And we, what we understood is, and what we learned is, it differs significantly. If you're somebody from working class background, and uh, if, your energy, if you are in energy poverty, then how you relate to it, versus if you're somebody um, in a sort of, a, a, I don't know, space engineering sector, and who has more means, would think about it very differently and relate to it differently. So when we had conversations that's tailored to where their concern are, so for someone it might be, how am I going to be able to get to work? For the other person it might be, how am I going to be able to feed my children? For another person it might be, how, we, how is it going to change and shape my community? So when we have those conversations with people addressing their concern that's relevant and relatable to them, dialogue happens, positivity happens, and consensus builds and polarization decreases. And uh, with, without going into too much detail of the research itself, um, there's a blog written by my colleague Emma James on our website uh, on fair energy transition. And based on our research, we've built some fictional characters, um, especially focusing on realities of people from marginalized communities. And it's a synthesized fictional character, but based on the research, um, gives, gives you those really tangible examples that um, would really picture it well, but much better than I can describe it right now. And very briefly, and then I'd love to hear from either Mina or Will. Um, Second. Sounds very positive, but where where is the leading edge of risk in that? The the edge of risk, I think, um, is hard for me to say. Like, if I'm really honest, that's not something that we've really, really had the privilege to invest our resources and do research into. And uh, I guess this is a call for funders to help us with that because. It's a concern for us, it's a risk we worry about. It's a research-based organization. If we don't have the funding, it's very difficult to demonstrate it and then mitigate it. Um, but what, I have, what we've seen anecdotally time and time and again is when there is a global event, um, for example, the current living cost crisis or the, the, what's happening within the country's leadership or what's happening with the sort of Ukraine situation or even what happens in, for example, in America with Trump's court cases. That could um, change people's priority in their order of how important and how, it, how much they're able to relate to the issue. So that's a risk. But we have seen, despite COVID and energy um, living cost crisis, that climate still remaining is one of the tops. Um, but if we don't move away from conversation to implementation, mm -hmm. and if we don't move away from conversation to reparations, because we do acknowledge there is a historical legacy here as well, um, I think there is a risk of emotions getting high and the, the, the divides becoming greater and it becoming a bigger challenge to bridge them. But I think the moment is here for us to bridge those divides and work together. Thank you so much for voicing that. You forgot the second part of the question, which was how you got to do all this amazing work. <laughs> what brought you to it? I have to highlight, I'm not a researcher. It's a, it's a team of researchers and communicators at Climate Outreach who does the brilliant work. Just come and talk about it and take credit for it. <laughs> she's, she's being really modest here. Um, I think, you know, um, from my intro, hopefully it's very obvious that why I got into climate change. I don't remember the day that I wasn't interested in it. When I was very little, it was more in the context of environment, sea level rising, we need to build a seawall, tidal wave is coming and all of that. So the language and the geographical sort of phenomena and aspects we are talking about in the ecological, um, I may not get my vocabulary right there, but that have shifted but the impact just keeps escalating and it's the same thing. So in my lifetime, I've seen um, us having a housing issue, 
uh, our islands see fresh water disappearing and we no longer have a single drop of fresh water in the country. I've seen a country's diet change so drastically that there are health issues which is just common now and accepted. And because I moved to Europe when I was a teenager, when you go back once a year, it's much easier to see the changes. And it impacts you uh, in a very different way compared to when you're living there. Because when you're living there, um, and this is something that I see really beautifully um, in my family and friends, that human resilience to adapt. And uh, that being able to see how a country has adapted um, sort of, you know, we're a small country, given that, but for us, it's a big feat to go from a fishing country to a luxury tourism country. And f we might be small, but that's quite a huge achievement for us. And we've gone from not having any seawall to having sea, sea walls in almost every island uh, where humans live in my lifetime. So to see the resilience and the ingenuity and the bravery and the courage and the passion of my friends and my family makes gives me hope that is possible humanity can do this it's possible it's not the end of the world we can thrive we we can reimagine a new world the my island does not look like anything i have ever imagined even when i was 10 years old or 15 years old i remember drawing what my island will look like and it did not look the same but it's it's good so that ingenuity and that resilience and compassion plus the divides that do exist on a global level when it comes to this conversation is what drove me into the sector it's really asking the same question celia asked what breaks my heart and um, it is really what's happening to my family and friends and then on the other side on the other side i ask okay what what can i give and i have to say being able to move to europe to a global north country um, i I acquired a lot of privilege. And I asked myself, what am I going to do with that privilege? And then I noticed and I realized that it's really difficult for people like me who didn't grow up on this side of the hemisphere to be able to integrate and to be able to articulate what we think needs to happen in the movement. So I started focusing on internally how to make the movement more inclusive. So I developed my leadership style to build organizations that transform and um, uh, participates in diversity and inclusion. So it's a combination of what breaks my heart and what can I offer and what can, go, what can I go through that cycle, as Celia explained very beautifully. She did it much beautifully. A combination of what breaks your heart and what can be inclusive. You sound like a poet. It's beautiful. Thank you. Who would like to go next? You're happy to go next, Nina? Do you remember your question's fresh? Yeah, yeah. repeat the question, please. OK, I'll repeat yeah. it. <laughs> How do you bridge divides in your work? And what was the inner shift, the inner divide that you crossed that led you to the work you do now? Thank you. Um, when you ask this question, it's sort of impossible for me to not think about it in, in a sort of personal story way. Um, and Please. because my entire life has been a, a story about bridging divides, I uh, am the, the manifestation of a, a Finnish mother and a Nigerian father, um, so two very different parts of the world. I, um, I grew up in Nigeria, in Lagos, uh, in a society that was, uh, you know, right sort of in between worlds. Uh, there was a lot about my environment, which was traditional, uh, you know, customary, very African, very West African specifically. Uh, but it was also uh, a world that needed to be bridged with a legacy of colonization. So it was very much a neo-colonial uh, environment. Um, I grew up in an interfaith household. My father is Muslim, my mother was a Protestant, as many Western Europeans are. Um, 
I lived in a family compound with people who were Catholic, evangelical, uh, other, other Muslims. Um, my, my parents had met in Germany, um, lived there for 10 years, so they spoke German to each other, and I spoke Finnish with my mother, English with my dad. People around me spoke uh, Yoruba, which is the ethnic group that my family comes from. Um, so I was really, you know, bridging divides from very, very early on in my own personal life. I was trying to, to mitigate these many identities that I, that I had um, and that I saw were in tension. There was a lot of tension um, between these identities. There was a, uh, also, uh, you know, I would travel to, to Finland as a child and it was such a stark contrast to where I lived, um, which is not to paint an image that, you know, everything was doom and gloom in, in Nigeria by any means. There's so much beauty there. But, um, you know, I did frequently, on my way to school, I would see, you know, a, a dead body or something like that, or, or somebody being killed, or uh, just poverty, deprivation, uh, and then I would go to Finland and it's like, wow, you know, everybody, everything is so amazing and uh, developed. Um, and that really created, a, a, you know, it started to foster this, this sense of despair and heartbrokenness, uh, which still motivates a lot of the work that I did, do today. Um, when I was a teenager, I moved to Sweden. Um, I'm naturalized Swedish, and uh, in Sweden, I sort of uh, became racialized. So in Nigeria, I'd never really thought of myself in racial terms. Uh, of course, I knew about race, but uh, it, it wasn't something that featured very strongly in, in my persona. And, um, and so again, I was sort of trying to, to uh, bridge divides and and deal with polarization within and outside of me. And so it's, uh, you know, it's quite interesting that we, we are talking so much about polarization these days because to me that's nothing new to me and countless people on this planet, let alone the planet itself. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's always been a problem. Um, but all along I had, I guess a sense that you know there was a, a different way of being in the world. Uh, something else was was possible, and for me personally, uh, I felt that for the first time, really, when I encountered feminism, um, and even more specifically, black feminism. Um, this was in my late teens, early twenties. Uh, I, 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 I felt that something else was possible because. I felt like I could express my voice in this space. So the ways that I thought about the world, the things that I felt were unjust um, and could be better were being expressed by other people who had had similar experiences and who were producing knowledge about this. Um, and so that really is very much at the root of the work that I do is this belief that another way is possible and of course that way looks different to each and every person in this room, for instance. Um, but I think that that's something that really can bring us together. This sense that, you know, we, we, we probably all want to find another way of, uh, of making our world a better place for, for humans and non-humans and for our environment. And so, yeah, I think that that was sort of both my breakthrough moment and the way that I address uh, bridging divides in my work. Thank you so much for sharing that background, for sharing the story of your childhood. There is something very beautiful about that and I can see it must have been very painful as well, trying to constantly pull at these polarizations that you described that were inner and outer and perhaps are not spoken enough about, especially those inner ones. Recently, you wrote this article titled, 
exposing the gender gap in the climate movement or something. And a few years back, you wrote another, um, no, just a different topic. You wrote an article on exousience. They're both fascinating, and they both deal with very different threads, but they're all trying to bridge divides in their own ways. Would it be okay if you just told the audience briefly about these concepts and ideas and experimental ideas in your work and how you're trying to bridge those divides there? Great, thank you. Thank you, great question. Um, yeah, that's okay. I, I guess one thing that ties what I was just saying together with this question is that uh, through my experiences, I came to see that these questions about bridging divides, about identity in a sense, um, are very much so illusions. Uh, you know, they are, they are our constructs as humans because we have... Uh, we, we, we think, we intellectualize, and we have language, and so we, uh, you know, we've ultimately created these kinds of narratives. And nature doesn't really care <laughs> about um, us bridging divides, you know. The forests, the jungles, the rivers, the pollution that is destroying them, uh, you know, we can talk about bridging divides all day long, and mm -hmm nature doesn't really care, which is not to say that it's not important. It's, um, it's very important, but I think bearing that in mind, that it is a construct, it is an illusion, it is a sort of meta-narrative, um, also creates then a space in this narrative through which we can try to foster change. And I think that that narrative that we should be nurturing and bringing forth needs to be multi-perspectival. So it needs to be a, a narrative that really um, is able to affect us wholly, you know. Um, and so both of these, these um, pieces that I've been working on, Exusions, I'll start with the second one. Um, Exusions uh, is, a, is a concept that I, I coined in my latest book, Sensuous Knowledge. And it stems from the Greek word for power, um, which is exousia. And it came to me when I was, I was writing a chapter for my book about power. Um, and I was also spending a lot of time by rivers uh, at, at the time I was writing that chapter. Um, I've always, been drawn to rivers, um, partly because in the Yoruba religion or spirituality, which is known as Ifa, um, each person has an Orisha, and Orisha is a kind of a deity that you are assigned. Uh, it's a little bit like a horoscope, but more, uh, more, more philosophical. Um, and my Orisha is uh, called Yemoja, uh, and she's the goddess of, of all the water bodies. Um, and so I've been sort of advised that, you know, whenever I'm facing challenges in life or uh, opportunity uh, to sort of reconnect with, with water bodies. So wherever I travel, wherever I am, I, I tend to do that. And I was uh, in a challenging place in life when I was working on that chapter about power. Um, I, I was grieving and just going through a lot of challenges. Um, and so I would go to rivers as much as possible. I was also traveling a lot, so I had the opportunity to, to visit new rivers, and, and I would spend hours watching YouTube videos of rivers, which is actually a thing. Um, <laughs> and it's, it's very, very beautiful, um, and I enjoyed it a lot. So the combination of writing about power, having come across this concept in ancient Greek of exousia, and spending a lot of time by rivers uh, just sort of produced this notion, exusions, um, which I came to define as a kind of a, an, a feminist and a, an, an alternative way of, of understanding power that I learned through rivers, uh, you know, through watching them, through speaking with them. Um, 
and not in a sort of anthropomorphizing way, right? But just really listening and being present and bearing witness to to what rivers are, how they how they function, and specifically the way that whatever obstacle a river faces, you know, the way that it, it sort of moves its way under, above, beyond, it just makes its way toward um, the ocean, which is its, its ultimate destiny. And that for me really provided this image of what power really is at its core and, and what it can be and how as long as we define power in the Europatriarchal ways that we still do as something that's about domination or violence or coercion, then we can never change power. So exuberance was really a, an attempt to provide a new lexicon for power that, that emanates, that is about compassion and about um, love, but also challenging structural oppression. I see, thank you so much. Power does underpin all of the structures within which you all operate. So it's trying to create that change and shift something at that foundational level. Will, would you like to share your thoughts? Do you want to hear the question again, or? Uh, no, I think, uh, I think Yeah? Cool. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> um, thanks very much for your story, by the way. Thank you. Um, I'm not used to speaking with a mic. Uh, I'm a little nervous as well, so sorry if I, if I um, stammer or anything or I talk too quickly. Um, I guess I'm not used, in, used in my work to bridging divides. <laughs> It's quite often the opposite, I think. Um, but maybe there is one, uh, maybe there is one divide um, that just the Paul is trying to bridge, which is the divide between the British public and reality, um, and the government and reality. I think uh, lots of conversations about climate breakdown can miss out what it actually is. Uh, and what climate breakdown is actually going to mean. Um, an article came out, a scientific um, paper came out in the journal Nature about a month ago. Um, it was published by Timothy Lent, I think. Um, I probably, probably got his name wrong. Lenton, yeah, that's right. Um, and it talks about uh, what the world is going to look like um, over the coming decades. Lots of, lots of research into climate change um, talks about the financial cost, kind of for obvious reasons, the world we live in. Um, but this one talks about the human cost of climate change. And it talks about what the world would look like at 2030, and then again at 2100. At 2030, uh, according to this paper, um, and this isn't a wild estimate, by the way, um, this is just some recent scientific literature, obviously published in the most prestigious journal in the world. Two billion human beings will be living in areas which are considered uninhabitable now, or barely habitable. Um, these are areas which have a, an average temperature year round of 29 degrees C plus. So they're outside of what's called the human climate niche, outside of conditions favorable for growing crops, outside of, of conditions favorable for living in cities. Um, that means that in the summer in these places, um, the crops will wither in, and die in the fields. And in the cities, the wires will melt, and tires will melt, and the road will melt. Electrical infrastructure will break down. Transport infrastructure will break down. And as a result, um, it's people suggest that one billion of those people are going to become refugees. By 2100, uh, they estimate that there could be as many as three billion people living in these areas and at risk of becoming refugees. Um, 
if you think about what that actually means, um, to become a, come, uh, the speaker before us um, spoke about how there was uh, 100 million refugees approximately um, caused by various conflicts around the world. What do you think our government is going to do when there's a billion refugees? What do you think the British government's going to do? What do you think Priti Patel or Suella Braverman would do? I think what this actually is, what we're actually talking about when we say that there's going to be one billion refugees by the year 2030 is a genocide. That's a genocide. That's hundreds of millions of people either losing their lives, losing their homes. <laughs> and in this case, it means once you lose your home, you not only lose your home, but you lose your homeland. These are places like India and Pakistan being literally wiped off the map because they're uninhabitable. Um, last year in, in October, there was such severe flooding in Pakistan that 30 million people were displaced from their homes at one time or another. 30 million people. What would that look like if it was happening in the UK? It makes me ask the question, like, what would we be doing if that was happening in the UK right now? Would we be in this room, debating, on a panel? We would be in resistance. And I think, to be honest, the reason we're not is because we're racist. That's the reason white middle class people aren't doing this. That's the reason people aren't taking this action in the UK that we need to be taking. I respect what you're doing, Rupert, but I think right now, there is no excuse for not being in the radical flank. There is no excuse for not taking the action we need to take. Because if we don't do it, we're complicit in a genocide. And that's heavy. <laughs> but that, to be honest, I think all that stuff isn't why I wanted to do this, or why I actually started doing this kind of thing. It wasn't to save the world, uh, even though I might like to have thought it was. Um, it was because it makes me feel like a braver person. Like, for once in my life, I was actually living by my values. Because um, I, I was basically, up until last year, I was like your traditional like liberal, liberal dickhead, you know what I mean? Um, <laughs> I, I, would be sitting, I would be sitting around in rooms, you know, drinking or whatever, talking the talk about Black Lives Matter, about racism, about climate change, but I didn't do anything. I didn't actually do anything at all. Um, there's a Martin Luther King quote. I'm going to I'm going to I'm going to quote Martin Luther King, but it doesn't mean I'm comparing myself to him. I think he's a hero. Um, Martin, Luther King, Martin Luther King said that the white liberals. I'm going to misquote this as well. The white liberals are worse than the KKK. They're the real barrier. And I think there's a version of that with climate change. It's people who talk about this but don't actually do anything. That's not what we need right now. We cannot let this happen. We just can't let this happen. There's going to be children, children born in the year 2030, and children born in the year 2040, and in the year 2050, and they're going to be born into an unbearable world. Sorry, thanks. So I want you to just answer the other part of that question, and then I'd like to respond to everything you've just said, and then after that response, I'd like other panelists to respond as well, and then I'd like to open the floor for questions. So there is a fascinating line in your bio, devote his entire life. I couldn't, I did research, I couldn't find, um, I don't know if you have a spiritual background or what the driving force impetus is. I mean, uh, we can see very clearly that there is that passion, that drive, and a lot of it is coming from just registering very consciously the danger that we face that is here. And I feel that when you began speaking, it was coming from a place of really wanting to strike that note, hey, all these conversations are great and they're, you know, they have their place, but this is critical. We need to voice how terrifying it is, which is, I feel like, with that report from Journal is what you did, which is great. And that should be present in the room. Um, but just to answer the second part of that question, which was when, when did that inner shift, inner divide happen for you? What took you from the liberal D head to this? <laughs> just briefly, and then I want to respond to everything you said before and the panelists as well. 
Um, yeah, so uh, I basically saw direct action happening. I saw Insulate Britain. Um, I spoke, was speaking to a fellow before in the audience, Steffi, Steffa, um, but he knows a, a woman called Bethany, and I was just on Twitter on my phone, like lying in bed or some, 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 something like that. Uh, sorry? <laughs> um, and I, I saw a video of a woman sitting on a motorway junction, and an SUV is driving into her. Um, it's Insulate Britain. They're an activist group from before Just Stop Oil. Um, they're trying to ask the government to insulate British housing because obviously it would massively reduce fuel poverty in this country and it would also do loads to uh, ameliorate the carbon cost of heating houses. Uh, and yeah, she's sitting in the road with her little banner and there's an SUV driving into her back, but she doesn't move out of the way. And I was like, fuck me, man. She's like staying there. She so believes in her commitment to direct action that she's unwilling to move. Um, and I was like, I, I, I just have to stop doing what I'm doing and, and do this as much as I can. Um, before I hand over, I'm going to plug Just a Paul as well, because that's what we're here for. We have to mobilize. Um, so <laughs> my friend Alex is in the back as well. And after this conference, I'm going to be going around with a clipboard, and I'm going to be asking if you, all of you, want to get involved in Just Stop Oil and doing direct action yourself. And if you don't want to, you can donate. You can donate to people who do, and you can volunteer as well to put on talks and events. Um, so thanks so much. Thank you so, so much, Will, for everything you said. So this radical, oh. <laughs> sorry, no, I, I love that bell, I really do. So I've been sitting with this divide protest versus outreach, radical flank versus moderate flank for a while, as of many people on this panel as well. Um, to respond to a couple of things you, s you said, well, I, I believe that, that there is a lot of value, not me personally, I think St. Otherberg is as a organization, as a space, you've heard the, well, you, no, sorry, you weren't here this morning, but Claire was telling the story of how the place was bombed in 1993, how it rose from the ashes and was very consciously brought back to life to be able to hold all kinds of differences and tension and experiences because there is a value to that, a foundational, universal human value of recognizing what connects us and that these spaces need to be honored, even kept sacred so that democracies function so that e something even more foundational than democracies, e just our humanity functions in a certain way. So that would personally be my response to the kind of call to action that you make, that you know everybody needs to be in the radical flank, but the organism of day-to-day -day life continues. You know, a family who's raising a five or an eight-year-old, they're going to need all the mechanisms that support that day-to-day -day life, that organism to, to get to just live. And the very existence of that means that conversations need to happen, relationships need to happen, connections need to happen that can function with the radical flank approach because it, it logistic, just practically it wouldn't work, you know? Um, and that's just one reason, but, that, but there are many, many more. So that would be my response to that. But I would now like to I would love to hear from Nora, from Rupert, from Mina, your response to that, and then I would, I would really like to open the floor for questions. Thank you. Um, the first thing I want to say is just thank you for your, your bravery. Um, it's very inspiring. It's, it's truly brave and courageous. Um, for you to s not just do what you do, but to, s to say what you just said in this space. Um, and I think that we, what we need in these times is people who are brave and courageous and, and what that means in return is to, to sort of be non-conformist. Um, I guess in addition to that and, and uh, you know, as a sort of to offer food for thought, um, I, th I think we live in the age of activism. 
um, I think activism sort of infiltrates everything else, and that's good. Like, I would rather live in an age of activism than in whatever the opposite would be, you know, p passivity. Um, but we see, you know, there's like, if you're an academic today, you have to be an activist. If you are a writer, you have to be. If you're a musician, you have to be an I mean, even if you are a baker, you probably have to be an activist, right? Um, and I think that that's a bit of a, a problem because um, it, it maybe takes away from uh, the real point of activism, I think, or at least one of the, the key things that it's, it's incentivizing, which is uh, the spirit of the visionary. Um, and that is a spirit that we, we find everywhere. You know, we can, you can have visionaries in bakeries, um, in engineering, in technology, in academia, and so on and so forth. Um, and so, yeah, I just want to add that, you know, even during uh, the civil rights movement or the second wave feminist movement, which, uh, you know, two, two movements that revolutionized society in a way that it is unrecognizable since. Um, and we're seeing similar uh, uh, build-ups today. Um, within those, and even someone like Martin Luther King himself, um, there was also a lot of um, art, you know, uh, singing was a part of it, dancing was a part of it, uh, all kind of like embodied uh, presence, cooking, consciousness raising, meditating, um, and then also creativity and dialogue. So I know you're not opposed to these things, I wouldn't imagine, but, but I do think that uh, it's important that we, we remember that being a visionary uh, can come in, in many ways. And what is important is that people become visionaries or at least support and encourage the spirit of the visionary and the, the person that can guide us uh, forward or the, the persons or the non-persons even. Uh, thank you, Noor. Thank you. Um, it does mean a lot when a white man says that. It means a lot, so thank you. Um, I will share that we do need to keep asking ourselves what the future holds. But I also think and believe that there are enough examples happening at the moment around the world where transport systems are collapsing, uh, communities, uh, food security is gone, health pandemics are just prevalent and part of normal life now. Um, for example, Maldives spends 50% of their annual income on climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, think about, you know, what the future will hold and what the future holds for a Maldivian. So, yes, I believe in activism. I personally don't feel like I can and I have the privilege to do it. And I think for movements uh, where it is important for the activism to be there, always present, but for it to transform and transcend into the next level, there needs to be more compassion and empathy, um, and not just to the opposing views and divides, but more about the intersections, how the issue intersections with the realities of people, whether it's gender, race, ableism, uh, social class, and really recognize the divide and the difference that exists because of these intersections, and deconstruct the power and the privilege that goes with it, and make the activism space and the movement itself more inclusive. Um, for me, I have been in climate change my entire life. But for the movement, I've only been in climate sector for a couple of years. And that, that, the way that's descri that describes me, I think it highlights a really big knowledge gap, understanding gap, empathy gap, compassion gap. And I think whilst I don't want people like you to stop doing what you are, and I will be rooting 
for you and for the work the organizations like yourself, Extinction Rebellion does. But I think we need to dig deeper. And part of that is understanding and humanizing each other and being able to have the uncomfortable conversation. And that's why I applaud activism because activism is often uh, the headline for starting those un uncomfortable conversations. But we don't want to get too comfortable in the narrative. We need to keep moving it. Thank you very much. Uh, so it's, it's completely obvious that when the history books are written, correction, if the history books are written, that Just Stop Oil will be regarded as being on the side of the angels. Uh, and it's completely obvious that the central demand of Just Stop Oil, uh, no new oil, by the way, that would have been a much, much better name, no new oil. Um, it is very catchy, the acronym is no, no. Uh, that uh, it's completely obvious that the central demand of no new oil is 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 correct. Um, yeah, you see, they, they like it. Uh, it's it's another question which we're not in a position to judge uh, at this point in history of whether just the oil will be regarded as having been uh, effective or not. Uh, just on a personal note. I would just note that it's not just that I helped launch Extinction Rebellion. I, I've been involved in nonviolent direct action for many years, and I've been in police cells, and I was arrested and charged with criminal damage for the Extinction Rebellion, and I was found guilty, and, and so forth. Um, so I have you know, got the T-shirt, as it were, uh, and I came to the conclusion that what we'd done in the radical flank in 2019 had changed the game sufficiently that it was time now, and many, many other people have reached the same conclusion, it was time now to do something that bridged the divide and actually felt quite difficult and uncomfortable because although it's unbelievably challenging and difficult in all sorts of ways to be part of the radical flank, you know, in Extinction Rebellion, I received, you know, lots of uh, hate mail, uh, death threats, m massive distortions, enormous pressure, burnt out twice, mental health episodes, et cetera, et cetera. But I also had the time of my life, and, and part of the reason for that is because it's actually, in a certain sense, quite a comfortable place to be, because you're being righteous with a load of other people who have the same absolute determination as you do. And the decision to actually step out of that space of, in a certain particular sense, comfort, and move into the in a certain way, much more difficult task of see seeking to actually engage in serious outreach to the British Britain Talk climate groups, which one is not necessarily a part of, to civic pragmatists and loyal nationals and disengaged battlers and so on. That's actually really tough. Uh, and it's, in my view, it's the, it's the work now. It's the, it's the most important part of the work. And I say that unabashedly because, as I explained in my opening remarks, there is no way we get to win on this unless we bring the people with us. In the end of the day, it is that simple. And so when you say, um, I respect what you do, Rupert, but at this point there is no excuse for not being in the radical flank, well, with all due respect, it doesn't sound very respectful. <laughs> And I think what we need to do is we need to find ways of respecting, for example, the many, many British people who I think are not racist, uh, but who are not necessarily 100% signed up to what I think, let alone what you think. Uh, and if we're actually going to get somewhere, we have to take them with us. We have to find ways of taking them with us. That's what we in the Climate Majority Project are trying to do. And if that makes sense to you, then I would urge you to get involved with, with doing it. Probably some of you already are. We're not trying to start something ex nihilo. We're helping to name something uh, and network something which is already emerging, partly from out of Extinction Rebellion, but also from many, many other places uh, in our culture. Uh, and in our society. A and our hope and aim is that when that 
starts to happen, and it is starting to happen at a huge scale, uh, then that will be something which actually does force the political class to pay attention and act. Because right now, they ain't interested. Right now, they ain't interested. Hearing the two views, I obviously agree with you because I work for climate outreach and thus we are all about creating a social mandate. But I don't necessarily think two things are mutually exclusive. Um, I think, you know, we also forget sometimes that um, activism can take many forms as well. And direct action is not just the only form of activism. And I think, you know, this goes to your point about the constructs and the narratives that we have built. Um, so I think there is, there is a call to question that, those assumptions we have. Um, I think that's the respectful thing to do, especially if we want to be, bridge the divides between us. Sure. I mean, just to be clear, I was responding to the claim that the only responsible thing to do is to be part of the radical flank. Right? Uh, and I think there's, there's, there's lots of responsible things to do. And the Climate Majority Project envisages lots of things. It's not just one thing. It's people working in communities, in professions, in businesses, et cetera, et cetera. Find out more at climatemajorityproject.earth. Um, yeah, so I'm not making a claim for exclusivity. I was merely rebutting one. None intended. Um, but, but the reflection I have is that um, I think we can question what activism is. And we can use Britain Talks Climate Toolkit and British Segmentation and test narratives. What is the sort of activism, whether it's behavioral change at individual level or systemic level, that resonates and that turns their concern into action? So I think it's really important at, a point, at this point to really reflect what do we mean by activism and what are we hoping to achieve? Um, personally, I sometimes just want to scream at people uh, and just go like, you know, uh, do you know what my family ate today? Um, and just, you know, give the medical record for a lot of people because um, it's really lie, lie for me and it really, really makes me angry when people talk about climate change. It's something that's abstract that's going to happen in the future. It's happening now. But on the other hand, I also want real change and I don't know like how much me holding on to my truth and just trying to get that to people is going to make a difference. And time and time again, it hasn't. And I think that's what Rupert's coming from. So earlier when we spoke about that inner thing, that is the pain. That is the pain that is really live and real for me on an everyday basis. That, yeah. I admire the work you do, I'm thankful for the courage, but something deep inside me, you know, I, when I say you, I don't mean necessarily you personally, but a lot of people in the movement or in UK that, okay, speaking about climate change, we're speaking about the impact of climate change, but we're talking two languages. Um, people don't understand what, when I talk, and it's quite isolating and very insular. Um, so, yeah, and I think, that is the pain that I go through. And I think, as Rupert said, we have to constantly ask ourselves, are we comfortable? Are we comfortable in our form of activism? I'm not an activist by classic definition, but I believe I'm an activism because I've dedicated my entire life for something. And uh, I've, you know, for me, when I, when I work on organizations where to transform their recruitment process to make it more an inclusive process so we bridge the divides again and create space for people with lived experience to be within the organization and to create that change. That's also a form of activism. Mm -hmm. um, so I think we have more in common than we acknowledge sometimes. Working 
with the foundations of power in this philosophical realm, changing our attitude and whole conception, working with climate outreach, doing this very nuanced, very considered, slow, painstaking work, being on the front lines of the radical flank, and taking this evolution of XR and similar movements and looking at this awakening consciousness and see where you can take it next through climate majority. All these different approaches. And yet there is something that you do undeniably share, which is this moment of awakening, this pain that each of you registered somewhere in your innermost being, you know, when you were seeing that weed killer, when you saw that there wasn't a single drop of fresh water left. You witnessing those rivers and, well, just registering the pain of the loss that we're facing. So these stories remind me of something that Thich Nhat Hanh once said, that, well, he was asked, what is the most important thing that we need to do for life on Earth? And he answered, the most important thing that we can do is hear within ourselves the sounds of the earth crying. And each of you in your own way, it feels like you're trying to create connections or facilitate pathways where people can hear those sounds better, come into contact with them or find that place within themselves where that is awake. And there can be all kinds of disagreement about how we model reality, right? Which is what all the differences in philosophies and political outlooks, it's all disagreements about what is the most accurate model of reality. But on an experiential level and on a, dare I say, a spiritual and real time alive right now as a human being level, there is something that is really undeniably unifying us in a shared lived experience. Don't know where I'm going <laughs> next with that. I think I'll just, I'd love to hear from everybody in the room, well, from people in the room that we can, the time allows. Uh, So uh, c can we give the mic to the, the um, attendant here in, in white? Yes. Thank you. And I already forgot what I was going to say. Um, I, I think um, I wanted to respond with something around speaking to the theme of role and what it is to step into role. Um, speaking as a musician, I don't always expect to be the conductor uh, or the soloist or the accompanist uh, or the member of the chorus, but I'm aware that when I do step into one of those roles, I can't remember the other ones. Like that's what it is to really step into the role. So I wanted to kind of just bring that idea into the room, maybe to frame some of the conversations we're seeing here and to really honor and value each of you for stepping so deeply into that state of role. Um, also, there's the Buddhist uh, story about the four blind men feeling an elephant. Do you know it? So they all, they're f one saying, oh, it's like a, an elephant is a big wall. Another one saying, well, it's a snake, an elephant that's got hold of the trunk. Someone else has the tail. Um, and is saying, no, it's a, you know, it's a little snake with a furry tail. But, you know, the point is that whether we're blind or not, if we step to the part of the elephant we're really focusing on, I think it becomes part of it to take that sacrifice to not being able to see the whole thing right then. Um, and I, I want to you know, honor Rupert for stepping from one role to the other and to Will for stepping right into that place of um, taking personal risk and sacrifice, which is specific to the action you take, such that you 
it's really important to zoom in in detail on the place you're focusing so you can remain strong there. Um, and honouring those differences and how they will make a difference to the whole, um, whether it's good cop or bad cop. Or I I'm hoping that I can be jazz cop. So uh, that's not a question. I haven't asked a question. I'll give up the mic um, now if anyone wants to <laughs> respond to that. If there are any especially challenging questions in the room, I, I do invite them. Perhaps we were all agreeing a bit too much there in the end. OK, uh, lady here in the shawl. Or was it Hi. Um, <coughs> thank you. Yeah, thanks. Um, Thanks to the panelists and um, organizers of this. I'm not sure if it's a question, and forgive me for like. I, if I, just I would uh, highly encourage questions, precise questions, please. <laughs> okay, I can turn it into a question that I've been asking throughout the day, so I'll just repeat it again. Um, so one of the things is around, as we've heard many panel uh, peace speakers through the day, is holding like with tenderness all of these sort of messy, tricky, wicked sort of aspects, right? Um, whether we have whatever constellation of power and privilege and marginalities that exist within us and all of that and approaching tensions with that and um, empathy and, and these things. And, um, and I think that I'm sort of also s sending appreciation to Will for bringing up the term at this point in the day around racism. And I guess the question is that, how do we uh, cultivate and increase the capacity to go into discomfort around, around like power and, uh, and privilege, around racial privilege, around gender privilege, et cetera, when there's so much fragility around it and it's like, in my experience and others who have brought feedback around the impacts of X, Y, and Z um, with tenderness, with empathy, because of the fragility around it, um, it just, it's very difficult. And that's my question is how do we increase the capacity? And it's a question I've asked throughout the day, I've asked in other settings. I've been involved and in, in, immersed in this kind of contemplative change making thing for many years. And um, yeah, so I feel like it's, it's an important one that I'm <laughs> struggling and others are struggling to kind of get because I feel like that's at the crux of a lot of things. And if there was no climate crisis, let's say hypothetically, there would have still been the legacies of, I think, I don't even need to name it, things that affect all of the things like gender, race, ethnicity, uh, various other aspects. So. Yeah, I don't want to ramble on, but that was my question. And also thank you um, again to everyone, and Will especially for bringing up that aspect. So I'll attempt an answer to that question. Um, I'm going to take up the invitation that Michelle has given us and say something which you might not want to hear, uh, because it is boring if we all agree. That hasn't been happening, so I'm going to make sure it continues to not happen. Um, I think if we uh, launch into the moment that we're in uh, in uh, a society uh, like this one right now uh, and say things like um, what's critical here before anything else happens is that uh, white people acknowledge their white privilege and we deal with all of that, I think we're completely fucked. Uh, and I think that in this context, uh, increasing numbers of people are recognizing that there's a very real danger that identity politics here becomes toxic, divisive, profoundly divisive, uh, and that we need to, to depolarize a lot of its uh, effects. And that applies to identity politics of the right, i.e. You know, racist ethnic politics, and it applies to identity politics of the left. So my claim would be if we're serious about bridging divides, for example, here are some of the things we won't say. Um, we won't say something like this. Uh, because um, all of us are created equal and because uh, borders are artificial uh, and because we have to be kind to 
uh, migrants, uh, I will not sit down and at the table with or will not work with um, anyone who does not uh, advocate open borders, which is a position that some people now hold. They say, I'm not going to work with anyone who's not in favor of open borders. So it's a position that says, uh, I, everyone, we're all one, um, and therefore I won't deal with you people. <laughs> most people, actually, because most people don't believe in open borders. Or another example would be um, because uh, uh, we're, all, we're all humans and because uh, uh, we need to deal with uh, all oppressions, especially the worst oppressions, and because I, I love our most oppressed brothers and, si brothers and sisters, then um, it's not possible to include uh, women who um, believe in uh, the reality of biological sex uh, in our coalition. And, Anyone who is gender critical has to be excluded from the climate movement or excluded from our coalition. Again, a position that quite a lot of people now hold. And what I'm drawing attention to is that the structural feature of these positions, and I could go through a whole load more, another one is around racism, another one is around the radical flank. Um, the structural similarity between these positions is that in the name of a certain kind of universality, they create a divide and they say, people the other side of that divide, you, you, you don't even count and I'm not even going to be nice to you. Uh, so the claim we would make in the Climate Majority Project is that if we are serious about winning and if we are serious about having a future, and if we are serious about having <coughs> assembling a majority, if we are serious about allowing the silent moderate majority, the climate majority that is already concerned and whose concern will only deepen if we enable them to understand better how bad the situation is. If we are serious about that, then we will not proceed in those kind of divisive ways. And we will gently say to anyone who does proceed in those kind of ways, well, that's fine, you know, if you want to have that kind of movement, that's fine, but please don't pretend that you are interested in universalism or in bridging divides, when actually what you're doing is systematically divisive. So that would be my answer to your question, um, and I hope we can discuss it in a civil way. Yeah, please, go ahead. Um, so, I think that there's a contradiction in what you're saying, Rupert, in that on the one hand, you're saying um, that you want to reach out to as many people as possible, we don't have time to not be involved, um, and then on the other hand, you're sort of dismissing uh, real grievances that are not just grievances based in, uh, you know, the polarization debate or identity, but really in like, you know, what we're discussing here, as Will said, billions of people are losing their homes and, and that is very much tied Excuse to... Me, I'm not dismissing anything. What let me I finish dismiss? my point. Yeah, um, what, what, um, tell um, me what I dismissed. Um, by saying that we, you won't work with people who are, say, or you, you know, you're not welcoming of people who may be saying that, oh, biological sex is this and that, or that, you know, we need to open the borders. Um, I mean, why, why could those- I think you may have misunderstood what I was saying. What I was saying, I was disagreeing with people who say that. I was saying we, ha we have to make sure that the divide between, between uh, gender critical uh, people and, and trans activists is overcome, and that the divide between people who are pro-open borders and people who are not is overcome. I was saying. And, and we, we you want to have conversations with those yeah, people? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I'm sorry. In that yeah, case, sorry, I misunderstood I didn't what make you that were clear saying. Enough. Yeah, yeah. Apologies. Um, because I, because I, I agree, and in response to to the question, um, I've, I, I, and I want to go back to what I said earlier that nature uh, doesn't care about our terminologies, right? At the end of the day, it also doesn't care about. Uh, these, these questions about uh, race or gender and so on. And I think maybe I sense with you a kind of affinity that maybe in spaces of contemplation, um, it is easy that we, we bypass or we move away from, from those issues. And I think what we, we really have to hold at this moment is that yeah, these are, these are structural constructs. 
Um, and when we come together in a contemplative spirit, we are all one and we want to bridge divides and all of this feel good, positive stuff. But we should never mistake that for an invitation to forget about the real structural issues that do divide the world. Um, and in some sense, actually being in a space uh, that is almost akin to nature, where we, where we, where we are acting from a place uh, not of identity, but of uh, facing the present crisis, or multiple crises even, um, that does mean that we acknowledge the, the real structural issues of race, of gender, of transphobia, uh, homophobia, you know, all of these things. So, yeah, but I'm glad that we, <laughs> that we do agree. Um, thank you for the question. I have a very simple answer to that, and I say this to everybody. Um, it's not going to be comfortable. The sooner we accept that it's going to be an uncomfortable, um, fragility is not comfortable space. And the sooner we confront that discomfort, it gets easier. Yeah. And I, I, I mean, I don't want to. I, I don't have a magic answer, but what I can tell you is what I'm trying to do at an organizational leadership level. Um, we have this, we make space in the organization, we prioritize having these uncomfortable conversations within organizations, and that could be in the movement, that could be in community spaces, that could be in families as well. Making, prioritizing and giving it. Um, I think when we are mi in mission-focused movements, we tend to forget that these, in, these things are priorities and we tend to be l focused more on the movement itself, but we shouldn't forget these are the underlying inequalities that needs to be addressed for us to move on. Um, that's the first thing we do. And the second thing we do is we intentionally break the barriers of entry for the movements and sectors. And that starts with um, recruitment process itself. A very simple example is we tend to ask a lot uh, for experience for every single role. Do we really need experience for every single role or do we need skill and attributes? So really, really asking ourselves and deconstructing and questioning and being curious about these narratives and assumptions. Um, and that's, that's the way to get through it. It's a journey. We're not there yet as an organization. I, as an individual, not there yet. Um, it's, it's a lot of work. It's, a, it's, it's, it's not a destination. It's a journey that we constantly have to invest in. Um, I just want to give a big shout to the other box training that um, is really good for organizations, especially in purpose-driven organizations that helps with the journey. Thank you. Uh, can we take one more question? Yeah? Okay, and then Rupert will be pressed for time. Yes, thank you, Ahmed. Um, thank you for all your contributions. Um, in 2015, in the run-up to the Paris Agreement, uh, Christiana Figueres convened an under-the-radar conversation between what were broadly describing themselves as insider groups, including the institutional investors, who I was working with at the time, and the like, bankers, others, and the outsider groups like Greenpeace and others, who came together to hold a conversation on how to meld a joint strategy that was managed in private to drive a public conversation to secure the text of the net zero 2050 signal within the Paris Agreement. It's been done. That kind of conversation is possible. So my question really is mainly to Nora and Will, is how can Just a Boyle have the conversation with climate outreach and vice versa about enabling just a will to frame narratives that cut through to the majority. Thank you. Don't worry, 
sorry, nobody's being told to shut up if they want to say something. It's their speaking when, when they want to contribute. Um, <laughs> my basic argument to this is that I don't think we need the majority of people, um, at least to make political change and inroads. Uh, you know, at, at the time, um, <laughs> I keep drawing on analogies to the civil rights movement, um, and I should definitely read a, a, a wider range of literature on civil resistance. But I think it's true for many of these, many of these issues that at the time in which they make wins, they're incredibly unpopular. MLK, when he died, he was assassinated. He was the least popular person in America, according to some studies, the least popular pu public figure with huge disapproval ratings. And this is true for the suffragettes who people despised. It's true for, um, it's true for the Okpor movement in Serbia, at least you know, as they were starting out. Um, I don't think we need the majority of people to be on our side. Um, in any case, I think um, where, where people hate the, hate the tactics of direct action, they often come to support the aims. Um, and that's, off, that's, that's been true of just a poll as well, where a, a small minority of people support both the aims and the tactics, but a much larger majority support, now support uh, the government uh, issuing no new fossil fuel licenses. And that's why the Labour, government, the, sorry, the, Labour, uh, the Labour Party has now backed that, and it's in their manifesto in all of the political parties as well, um, with the exception, obviously, of the, the key party, which is the Tory party. Um, I'm not sure if that's a very good answer, but that, that's, I think, my perspective on that. Um, but I, uh, uh, no. We started that conversation at the back and then we got distracted, had to walk up to the panel. Um, and I think that's why Will wanted to give me the mic because we start of, started that conversation and exchanged contact details. Um, so we are working together to bridge divides and public engagement is possible. I agree with you. Um, it's possible. I think the challenge is always to continue and sustain that engagement at political and social level. And because the climate crisis is such at a point that there is such an urgency that we have to take drastic actions. Um, so one of the things that Climate Outreach has been experimenting um, and uh, is what we called Climate Engagement Lab. Um, the, in a very simple way, is really um, opening up our services uh, for organizations that exist within the climate movement itself, uh, religious movements, religious leadership, community uh, work as well. Um, and to our delight, um, sports organizations came and joined as well. And what we did was we actually um, had a really good conversation, a bespoke conversation, what is the segment of the population that you are trying to reach? Um, is it middle class privileged? Um, is it the community health workers? Is it the uh, local police? And try to build narratives that bespoke to their thing, to their area of work. Because climate movement doesn't need to be a s sort of a separate movement. It needs to be something that's really integrated, part of everybody's lives. Um, so we're really open to it um, and uh, we really look forward to get interest from all parts of society to work with. And uh, because funding is a scarce issue for us and I think that does question the power dynamics that exists within the movement itself. Um, in an ideal world, if, fund, if we had unlimited funding, we will be really focusing on community-led organizations um, and a uh, healthcare sector, because our research shows that environmental uh, personalities, environmentalists are engaging apart, uh, with people already in the movement, apart from Sir David Attenborough. So, but our research shows that health professionals, GPs, paramedics, nurses, they are trusted messengers within societies. So are leadership and faith leaders. So that's where we would really like to focus. And that doesn't mean we don't value the work other organizations do. We just have to prioritize for maximum impact. Okay, we are really pressed for time. Rupert, thank you so much for staying beyond what we <laughs> initially agreed. Thank you so much. And thank you to Mina, Nura, Will, and Rupert, all of you for your contribution and to all the attendants who asked their questions and everybody in the room who, who listened and partook in this. Thank you so much.
Take care. Thank you.